Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinSlift.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching the video version of this at FunkinStuff.net or on YouTube or listening to the audio-only podcast version, from providers like iTunes and Spotify. As always, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in the show. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. All kinds of goodies you'll get, uh, early premieres, and it's all free, so make sure you sign up, tell a friend, tell family. Also get your official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff gear at the FunkinStuff.net store. Cool stuff like I'm wearing right here, Truth and Rhythm shirts, Show your support and love of the show and also the musicians and the music that they represent. I um, also want to give a shout out to the Funk Exhibition Center and Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, of which I'm very proud to be an official Funk Ambassador. Go to thefunkcenter.org to learn more and keep the funk alive. And now, with all that, it's time to get on with the show. Enjoy. I'm pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership drummer, producer, singer Earl Young, a key contributor to the Philadelphia soul sound of the 1970s and founder of successful singing group The Tramps. Elected to the Musicians Hall of Fame in 2016, Young is an inventor of the disco drumming style and often credited as popularizing four on the floor bass drum beats as well as extensive use of the hi-hat cymbal. Among the group of musicians known as MFSB, Young recorded with greats like the Stylistics, Billy Paul, Joe Simon, the OJs, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, the Dolphonics, the Spinners, Blue Magic, the Whispers, the Manhattans, the Mighty Clouds of Joy, the Temptations, Phyllis Hyman, Willis, uh, Wilson Pickett, B.B. King, and the South Soul Orchestra. Besides the Tramps classic Disco Inferno, Young also played on the Blue Notes, If You Don't Know Me By Now, and the OJs for the love of money. Earl, wow, that's quite a resume. Congratulations oh, and welcome man. to the show. It was all, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody. And uh, it was all fun and it still is. That's outstanding. And, and you're looking great. Uh, congratulations on that. Where are you coming to us from? I am from Maryland, from Bel Air, Maryland. And uh, I, your wall of fame there is quite impressive. I assume that's your studio or your study or what? Uh, this is my, I guess I, I call it, this is my museum. I have, I guess, about 50 gold albums here. You know, I got Mary J. Blige, 50 Cent, uh, The Game. I mean, I I play with, rapper, with rappers too. You know, I won, you know, I got a couple Grammys. I got a couple Grammys for some of the artists here. So, you know, it was a lot of work, a lot of work, but one of my prized possessions is, is like being inducted into the Musicians Hall of Fame with Garth Brooks and the Eagles, and, you know, it was very cool. Yeah, wow, congratulations on all of that. And uh, been looking forward to this and so glad you could uh, participate. So before we jump in, just, you know, gratitude, thank you. Thank you. So, Let's go back to, you know, how Earl first uh, gravitated towards drums and who were some of your inspirations? Okay, uh, let me tell you how I got started first into the music business. About in back in the 60s, you know, as I guess I was a teenager, a young teenager, and 
I wanted to sing. I wanted to sing because I had always had a deep voice. So I said, I, I used to sit in, they used to have house parties and house parties with the red and blue lights in the basement. And I used to listen to all these groups from the, like the Temptations, Mary Wells, and a lot of the other groups. So I said, I can do that. So what I, so what I did, I went and got a friend of mine named Jimmy Ellis, who's the lead singer of the Tramps now, but we were young then. And we wanted to, to sing doo-wop, man. And so we went and I wrote a song called Down by the Oceans by the Exceptions. So the, the gang can go online and pull that up now here singing doo-wop. And that, and that was back in the, the days of Hollabaloo. The Hollabaloo, they should have record hops call in. So Down by the Ocean was a pretty, was a pretty big record for the two of us. Then what, what I did, I had another group called the Volcanoes. I don't know if people remember the Volcanoes, but the Volcanoes was another doo-wop group back then. We had a record called Storm Warner, Ladies Man, and uh, Hell Warner. So I had two, two groups singing. And we used to go back with the form, nothing really big, but we, you know, that, uh, the record did pretty good. So when both groups broke up, what I did, I took Jimmy Ellis from, from the Exceptions, I took two of the brothers from the Volcanoes, and I, and, and I said, I'm gonna make, make a group. And this is, and at the same time, I was in working into the, I, I got it, I got it to a, a well, it was a semi studio. But what I did, I put I put all the, I put both these groups together. We worked around town, little chilling circuits. So I I got it. I got a um, uh, a job, you know, from, from working in the clubs. They called me to work into the. There's a big theater in Philadelphia called the Uptown Theater. The same as Apollo in New York, and all the singers have to come to this theater. When they come to Philly, everybody went to the Uptown Theater, which is still there now, but it's been closed for a long time. So I got the job as the house drummer there. I couldn't read no music. I had a, I had a broken, I, I had a, a drum set that I bought from the pawn shop. It was a mixed match, and. Well, but let me say how I got there before I got there first. How I learned how how I learned how to play drums was I was raised in I was raised in two foster homes, so I didn't have a mother and father. I was raised in two foster homes, and very poor. And I went and got four four chairs, and I put phone books and with tape on them. They don't have phone books no more. Two phone four phone books on chairs and two Maxwell House coffee cans. So I'm taking you back some of you can remember these. That's my symbols. That's how I learned how to play drums because I didn't have no money, I didn't, you know. And I was a kid and I went to this, I went to this theater called the Uptown. And I went to see Pearl Bailey. And Pearl, 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 Pearl Bailey husband is Louis Belson. Louis Belson was- Drummer. Was, yeah, he was the first drummer that I ever seen that had two bass drums, and that and I was amazed by that. He was the first one to put the two bass. I said, "Oh man, I wish one day that oh man, it, you know, if I could play up here." And after the years, I did get the job at the Uptown with my band. Sam, it was a Sam Reed Orchestra, and they hired they hired me. I couldn't read music, but I always had good timing. So. I had this job at the Uptown, and I was still putting singing doo-wops on the side. So, you know, being a poor kid, man, anything I could do to to make a dollar, I was there. So Jackie, so I had to play for all these artists. But most of the artists back then, they had, uh, they all had their own drummers. Because back then, they had like seven or eight, nine acts on a show. It ain't like it is today, you see one. They had seven to act. I mean, Stevie Wonder, you know. I would, so Jackie Wilson was on the show, and in, in the back there was a, like a little bar. Everybody used to hang at the bar at halftime. So his drummer didn't show up, and I had to play with Jackie Wilson. I said, "Oh man, I gotta play with." Him. I actually, because I used to just sit there because everybody had their own drummers. I was just like a. I said, so Jackie Wilson came to me and said, "Look, I want you to play for me because my drummer uh, is late." 
And I was nervous. I, I, I was nervous. I got to play. And I couldn't read music. But since I always had these house parties, I always, always knew how the songs went. Lonely teardrops. I knew these songs from dancing to bop, you know, in, in the basement party. So I, I, I said, I'm going to do my best. I, I played that man. These are, these are my drums. Yeah, I'm sitting there. I played that man. Jackie Wilson spin around and did that thing, came up to me and gave me the, the OK sign. Man, that was the best feeling, feeling in my life, man. I mean, that was a great, that was a great thing. Came here and said, thank you. Thank you, Earl. You know, you, you, you saved, you saved me, man. And that was, and that started my, that actually started my drum career because, because after, on that show, it was produced by uh, DJs. Jimmy Bishop and Georgie Woods was the, was the biggest disc jockeys in Philadelphia, and they owned some artists. So this is how I got into the studio, too. About, about, well, how, about how old were you uh, with the Jackie Wilson drumming? I was about 20, 23 years old. About 23, somebody made 23, 24 years. I was, I was young, you know? So they took me into the studio and said, look, we're going to... Uh, we cut some stuff. You want to come in the studio with? So me and my, I had a band with me, Norman, and Ronnie. We were just playing Chillin Circuit, which is a Chillin Circuit where you, you just play and, and they they give you a bottle of beer and a couple of dollars, man. That was to pay. So I'm on the Chillin Circuit, but we all knew each other because we played together so long. So they say, look, I'm gonna take you and Norman and Ronnie Baker in the studio. We want to cut some stuff. So I, hey, I'm, I'm afraid. I said, geez, I can't be no music. What if I can play this stuff? But I've always been determined that there was nothing that I couldn't do. So I went to the studio, and we was cutting Barbara Mason. And we cut uh, Yes, I'm Ready. And we cut uh, Johnny C, Boogaloo Down Broadway. We did Brendan and Tabulations. We did Eddie Holman, Hey There, Lonely Girl. Because this these jockey owned these artists. So here I go into the studio for the first time and come out with all these gold records. Wow. The first time in the studio, here Barbara Mason, Beckett Big, Eddie Holman, uh, Hey and Lonely Girl, Big Johnny C, Boogaloo Down Broadway, Brendan Tabulations, just to, on the tip of my tongue. I, I, I said, gee, this, and I made it, I made a hundred bucks, I made a hundred bucks of, of recording. I said, man, if I can make this, Playing, this is what I'm going to do. All I got to do is sit back in and just play. And that was my start. And if, if this was before Philadelphia International Records, this was before the sound of Philadelphia. This was the start of uh, the, the Philadelphia sound. So I said, well, look, I, if I can do this, I, this is what I'm going to do. Because I didn't have much of education. Because being in a foster home, I, you know, I had to, I had to stop school to get a job and and work so i managed to to, to, to get to, i managed to get these sessions and i put some money in my pocket and i and i got a little reputation because once you get a gold record on one thing and then another one boy you're getting hot so people say like, who played on this well earl played on okay well, let's let's bring him in here to play on this let's bring him in to play on that so i actually learned in the studio i didn't i didn't have no teacher i didn't have nobody to show me anything that's why my my sound is different from anybody else's because i created my own way of playing and that that brought me up to where i had uh my first drum and i had my first singing group so i got the i i, I got my singers over here and I, and I already started my drum career. So I went back to my boys. Since I got a job in the studio, I went back to, I went back to my boys and still made a little record hop. Then Gamble and Huff called me in. He started up a, he started up a company. So he had, Gamble and Huff had a, um, his own, he was a singer. So he had a, a group called the Romeos and he had Tommy Bell which is a big producer now. He was his keyboard player. He had Roland Chambers, which was his guitar player, was one of the session guys. And uh, he was a singer. And uh, they were like competition. 
So then he, he, Gamble got a hit record. He Gamble went to the studio and started his production. So when he started his production, he did uh, uh, the Intruders. First act, well, the second act was the Intruders. So he cut Cowboys and Girls and uh, United. And so his drummer, Carl Chambers, left. Uh, I guess I think he went on. He went to go on the road to play with some of the act. So they called me in to play of the three of us. So that was my chance to come into the really another studio. So I came in, and my first act was the uh, Intruders. My first act with Gamble and Huff I played was the Intruders, and it was a, a song called "I Always Love My Mama." and win place and show these are the two records i played with the intruders and they were big hits so i said geez i must got some gold on me man <laughs> so every, everything i was touching was you know was, was was going like this you know for some, i don't know it wasn't probably it wasn't up to me but it was just i was in the right place at the right time so as i was in the studio i said look i want to i want to uh still do my thing so I went back and got Jimmy Ellis. I'm still in the studio, Jimmy Ellis, and two of the volcanoes. And I said, I want to put my own group together. I said, I, said, I can do what they're doing. I can sing. So I went and I got a, a, a little studio time. And I heard this record by the Coasters called Yakety Yak. And on the flip side, if this is back in 45, these kids never seen 45, some of them. But on the flip side of a 45, there was a thing called, uh, uh, flipped out of Yakety Yak with a song called Zing With The Strings Of My Heart, which was, dear, when you smile at me, I heard a melody. And I said, I could sing that. It was the bass singer, but he sang it real slow. So I went and took that song, and I put a little Motown beat behind it, because Motown was big then, too. I know it was a little Motown beat. And I, I got actually went to I get, went Buddha Records and I talked to Neil Bogard along with Harry Chippett. And Neil Bogard said, let me see, a, a bass singer singing lead, that's different. I don't know what to sell, but it's a little doo-wop and it's, well, let's try it. So he put it out on, on Buddha Records and it was a hit. It was a hit for me. So, so I, I needed a name and I needed an album. So he said, look, we got to get it. You, you, you don't have a name. So I said, look, I, I want to get a name that is so stupid that people is going to remember it whenever they hear it. Because that's what it's all about in the music band, is remembering what you saw and heard. So I said, let me see if I can get a name. So I had names like Bummy and the Bums, the Hobos. I had the Tramp, the Tramps. I said, but then there was a group called Super Tramp at that time. Mm. So I said, I can't use a tramp because it's Super Tramp. I'll get sued if I use that. So I said, what I do, I'll put another M in it. So I, so I spelled the tramp's name with two M. That's why it's, it's two M's. So I put it out. It was a big, it was a pretty big record for me. It took me, it took me all, even overseas tour. And then I signed with Atlantic. I got a, well, I signed with Philadelphia International Record. First, I bought it to Gamble, and I, I went. I said, "Well, look, I'm going to get my own record company." So I got my own record company called Golden Fleece. So I put some of my music on my own record company, and he distributed my record company, Golden Fleece, the Trams. So that's how that happened. And I went over. I went overseas with just one record, Zing, and uh, got popular. So then I uh, signed with Alani. This was before disco. This was this would be what no disco. I signed with Atlantic, and Atlantic um, signed us up, and they actually turned it turned us into. It wasn't really a disco because we was a, we were an R and B group. We wasn't a, we wasn't a disco group. We was an R and B group. But at the same time. I left. To, I said, "Look, I, look, I, I have to go back to to the studio because I, because I have some recordings I have to do because Gamble Kenny Gamble called me in to work, 
So my studio was like going to work every day. Get up, brush your teeth, get dressed, and going to work. So when I get there, uh, Joe Taj had my drum set up for me. They they even brought me a, a pair. They even bought it, had a set just made for me, which is the one here. I had 50 years. It's called Fives. And uh, they tuned it up just for me because he knew how I play. I play different from anybody because I have... I have that I hit I hit the rim and the snare at the same time, which gives a a big fat sound because I wanted my drums to sound fat. I didn't want them to sound like it was playing jazz or something. So that's why my all my records have this big fat sound. So Joe, Joe speaking about Joe Tarz, I had to talk about him because he's one of the greatest engineers that there is. He knew how to put. We used to take two mics, one on the top, one on the bottom. One on the top, one on the bottom, top and bottom, top and bottom, two over here. And I used to have a piece of cardboard taped around my snare drum, which nobody did. So when we mix it, this, that, the hi-hat, we used to call it the sock symbol. The hi-hat didn't bleed into the snare. You could mix it easy. And back then, they didn't have the little plastic thing they have now. We used to have to put our wallet, tape our wallet to the snare drum to get a muffled sound. But Joe had my stuff set up, and uh, that that is the first part of, of my career with both acts starting. And it moved on when I went back to the studio. Gamble called me in and said, look, we got some, some more deals. So we came in, and I, I did uh, Joe Simon, Down the Sea of Love. He said, look, oh, look we're going to cut Joe Simon. Big gold record. We're going to cut Jerry Butler for my, you know, we cut the Iceman album, Gold. So I, I did the, uh, we did some of the Love and Spoonful, even. We, we, we cut them. I did, uh, uh, I, I mean, I go all the way back when, when I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the inspirations, the sweet inspirations, we did them. And so things got to be very good. So, some of the things that, you know, really made me feel great was when Wilson Pickett and B.B. King came into the studio and Wilson Pickett told me, he came right over to me and said, Earl, put the music down. All I want to do, I want to feel it because he, he's a stomper. And he saw, <clears throat> Earl, will not you put it right here? You know, don't let the green grass fool you. You know, and engine, engine number nine. He saw a storm before he said, look, I just want to feel that. I just, I just want to feel that that, that that four on the floor. And I, I like that because I ain't like it being music no way, man. I know you, you, we, always had to, we always had to follow a chart, but we didn't have I never follow note for note. They give me a chart and I look at it. I rearrange it, uh, what I want to put in there, and that's it. But basically, I put the groove together but I followed how the song goes. And um, Wilson Bickett came in there, man. We laid them two tracks down, Engine Engine Number Nine and Going to Green Grass. Boy, this guy was in love, boy. He said, love it, man. And B. B. when B.B. King came in, B.B. King is the same way. B.B. King sat, sat down there with Lucille and sat right in front of me and scared me to death, you know, because these, these guys, they like legends, you know, to me. I said, I, mean, I can't believe I'm getting to play with B.B. King. Man, I can't believe that. So with B.B. King, you don't have no music. You, you groove. You ain't no such thing as no, 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 no charts. Look, you play because he don't, read no, he don't be reading no music. He, he, he goes by. I, and that's what I like because I have to feel everything that I play. I have to feel it. If I don't feel it, it ain't going to happen. So when they say, when he said, look, all you got to do is just give me a groove. Give, give me a funky groove and let me lay it in there. So I hit him on one of my, one of my favorite grooves, man. And we said, look, look, man, we, we played so long. We played so long that they had to stop. They had to stop us. And so I'm like, oh, okay, we got it. We got it now. We, I mean, we was grooving. He was grooving so tough, man. So that was like a that was like a big honor to me, you know. And and 
Look, I did those two, and I go back on the road with my group with the Trams, and had a land. And I had a because I was doing the same time with Atlantic Records was sending me over to you know to Holland because we were big in Holland. Like Holland is like New York, you know. We 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 were big there, so I go over over the road. I come back. I go in the studio. So I met. It was a fellow named Weldon McDougal who's really responsible for a lot of my uh, success, you know, because he got me he got me into the Uptown Theater, and he also got me a job with Stevie with Stevie Wonder, because I don't travel on the road. I'm strictly a, a studio drummer. I didn't really care for going on the road, but he said, "Look, little Stevie Wonder needs." He was little Stevie Wonder then. He said, "Little Stevie Wonder needs a drummer to go to uh, Tokyo." And uh, you're going to Yokohama. I said, okay, um, what I do? He said, we're going to fly you out there tonight. You're leaving in the morning. I said, I ain't even had no rehearsal. They flew me out there to Detroit. And when I got off the plane, I sat right behind the drums. I ain't had a chance to meet nobody. And the funny thing, they had all this music, sheets of music here. Playing, you know. I mean, how do you feel? You go into a strange place you've never been before. Strange musicians you don't know by yourself, and you walk right in. They put you on drums and they hand you a stack of music and saying, "Okay, I'm gonna count it all." No chance to rehearse. No chance to look at nothing. But the the things always saved me because those house parties that I used to love to dance to, I knew fingertips. You know, I knew these, I, I, and I knew Alfie, because Alfie and Fingertips was uh, uh, his big songs back then. You know, he was a kid, you know, and uh, it, I wasn't the best at it, but I got through it. You know, I got I got through it. We went on the road, and uh, and he's cool, man. He was cool with me, you know, because I knew I wasn't the best that he had ever, drummer that he ever played, because I didn't even have a chance to really rehearse. But uh, luckily that I knew the songs, so I got through that tour. And as I toured more, going to different places, I learned more about, you know, uh, uh, the songs. And he used to sit and talk to me, you know. And uh, the, the thing I liked the most about Stevie, was because with Stevie, when you talk to him, you don't talk to him like he's a blind guy. You talk to him like I talk to you. It's like he could see you, and he liked that. You know, that's how I always, I've always been a street dude anyway. So I, you know, him being blind didn't, you know, um, was just like another guy I'm talking to that could see. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he showed me some things on drum because he's a hell of a drummer. And every time I appear somewhere with the tramps, you know, he'll come and sit in on drums with me. Like I, I worked the, uh, the Roxy in, Calif in California. He came. Many times. I used to live there. Yeah, out there. We went to Roxy. He he came and you know, and that was, you know, that was that was really cool to me. So my career, is, you know, it's, it, it's been it's been balanced it's been balancing out. And um, seventy nine, after all, all we had Disco Inferno. When Disco Inferno. Well, let me. Can I can I stop you there for a minute? Yeah. Before we get to seventy nine. Um, tell us about MFSB, mother, father, sister, brother, and the sound of Philadelphia, because you were integral to that okay. with so many of those acts, you know, and, okay. and that, okay. and that's in the early seventies. So, okay. First MFSB, uh, was all, to me, it, it was all, it's all a Philadelphia musician. What we did, it wasn't an orchestra that recorded together. We would cut rhythm, and then we would cut the uh, the rhythm would cut first, then the horns would come in, then the violins would come in, then we might overdub uh, uh, different kind of other things. We never sat down with a whole full orchestra and 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 like you might see Barry White con conducting. We never cut like that. Most people don't either, but uh, it's good for show. So. We did a couple, when I, we did some shows, we did a couple of shows, then we all go live because we know the songs like KG, you know, which won a Grammy for Saturday Night Fever. But uh, uh, MFSB was the rhythm section 
for the sounds of, you know, like the Funk Brothers. Well, we were MFSB, you know, mother, father, sister, brother. And um, it was mostly the guys that put the, that, that, that did all this. You know, all the guys are gone now, you know, they're all gone. And, uh, you know, I'm, I feel blessed to be able to survive to talk about some of the things we did at 80. But uh, it, was, it, was, it was, you know, it was great playing with, with, with MF. Well, MFSB was just a name. You know, it, it, it just stood for all the musicians in Philadelphia. That's what it really is. It, it wasn't no particular guys. Although, you know, although they had several hit records under that name, even as well as all those other artists. Yeah, but it's no certain guys. I mean, I mean, uh, Gamble owns the name MFSB, so he could use five guys here and call them MFSB. Five guys again on another record and call them MFSB. It's not like the Tramps, where 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 if this is my group. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not like that. It's like. He, he owns the name, and he can use whoever he wants and call him MFSB. But we were the first one because we're the one to have all the gold albums. You know, we're we're the one that put the gold albums out. After we after us, other guys came in to collect MFSB. Some of them I don't even know, and they just called themselves MFSB. When you were doing those sessions, or was it like an assembly line kind of thing, or did did you always know what song your parts were going to be on was that clear you mean, you mean with mfsb yeah because you know i know like some of the motown and some of like uh, the big groups like uh what george clinton did with parliament funkadelic you know where it was all these musicians and they were always laying down tracks and it's so much that they didn't even always know like what group it was going with and all that kind of thing until it finally came out well, well, that happened with us also because sometimes we got a we got a uh, a chart with, with no name on it, with no artist name on it, just a name, and we didn't know who it was for. So that happens because sometimes the producers they cut records and they sell it to another uh, artist. Like I, like they might cut, I might play on something, you know, called "I Love You," and then they might sell it to. Uh, Motown, I love you, and and they put it out on one of their artists. But uh, who's ever the producer, whoever the producer of the record owns the rights, basically to uh, to do that. But we didn't do that too much. But now with MFSB, what we did do was we used to cut grooves. We used to just make songs, you know, or we might take words off of a song uh, and put it out as an instrumental. Like some songs you might hear had words to it. And they took the words off and put it out as an instrumental. You know, that happens quite often. Mm -hmm. What What was it like, though? Were, were you um, aware you were on uh, tracks, like I mentioned at the beginning, like For the Love of Money, right, with the OJs? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember some of those specific songs like that that are classics that you were involved with? Well, I remember every album up here has a story. Every album, I can remember what I went through, the good parts and the bad parts and everything. Everything has a story. And I remember, uh, um, I, have, I guess I can go back with, with, with uh, For the Love of Money. Because most, 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 of, the, most, of, the, most of the grooves and stuff, we, we really made up. We really made most of them grooves up ourselves. Like, like, like nobody told us what to play on that. I mean, they give us a chart, and nobody ever tells me what to play. Only time I, somebody told me what to play was when I cut for Tommy Bell. You know, Tommy Bell was a hard person to work for because he does write down every note. Mm -hmm. So I. I had to go in and learn how to read music with Tommy Bell. So my boys took me in a uh, room and taught me how to read because they said, look, we're, going, we, we're coming into some hard music now and uh, you're going to have to learn how to read some of these charts. So when, when, one, of my hardest, one of my hardest charts was people make the world go around because it has 
different time signatures is going back and forth to five, four, 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 three, four. So I, I learned, I learned because I had to learn. I need to learn it don't work. So, uh, uh, but basically, most of like most of the song like "Bad Luck" and "The Love I Lost," "The Love of Money," uh, some of the most of the Blue Note songs, you know, what they do, they bring a chart, and and they bring the artists in, and the artist will sing, you know, I, he's standing in front of us, and then and they, uh, Huff would play the piano and let the artist sing for us. So by me being a singer, I know what drummers what to play behind a singer because I'm a singer myself. I know what they want. Mm -hmm. So they play it, and while they're singing it, I write down on my chart where I want to put everything at, you know, where I want to put a fill, how I want to play the fill and everything. So when they finish singing it, they leave the room, and uh, we start. We start because no singer is ever in the room while we're recording. They just come in there. And they show us, you know, especially the old days, they come in and they might sing the song. And then uh, we cut the track. And I have no idea how the song really goes after that. But once I learned the format of the song, because all songs have a format. Once you learn the format and, you you know, you know how this, how this is going to go, then I can just put my four on the floor or my groove in there and and do it. Because we never hear a finished song. I never hear a finished song until it come on, the basically until it's on the radio. I always hear the finished tracks. So when the song come out, it's my first time hearing it. You must you must be amazed or surprised sometimes when you finally hear the final version, right? Well, I'm not surprised because I know, I know uh, basically where I'm going to stick everything at. So it's up to them to sing sing the song because I can play around. I mean, I'm, I'm a musician and I'm a singer, so I know where to put different fills, uh, uh, different breaks. I, and I'm one that like to play. I, I always play along with the guitar because the guitar always play the breaks on the, on, on the, was the A16 or 32 bar. They might be playing a groove like dun, 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 So I like to play that. We're not playing to I like to play along with the uh, rhythm. That's one of the things I love to do because it's hard to do because you got to play exact. You got to play exact on time with the rhythm. But I like to do that because it fattens the song up. You don't hear that too much on on uh, on records. But you, that's why when my records come on, you always hear me playing along with the licks. You know, and th that's one of the the diff, like you know, like people always ask me, what's the difference with Motown and Philadelphia? You know, and I always tell them the same thing. I say, Motown has great musicians, Philadelphia has great musicians, but Motown records different from when we record. They are in-house musicians. They only play for Motown, and we play for anybody to come through the door with a check. I don't care who you are, what kind of if it's, if you got jazz, you can be country country music. We don't care poker, we play it all. So when we come to work, we don't know what we're going to do. We have no idea who we're going to record that day. They say, look, they call me and say, Earl, you got a session tomorrow morning. They don't say who it is or what you're doing. When I get there, I find out who it is. So you have to be prepared to play anything and everything. And so the thing is, oh, I only like funk music or I only like disco music. You got to like country music. You got to like jazz. You got to like everything when you're a studio musician. And it's the fact that most musicians don't know me because I don't do shows. I don't play drums on shows. I don't spin sticks and all that. I don't do solos. I do one thing specific is going to the studio and, and create grooves, create grooves to make the singer sound better to push his record. That's all I care about. I don't care nothing about solos or how fancy uh, I can play. I don't play fancy. Mm -hmm. So I singers, play, singers love I, you. I play in the pocket. And the singers must so, love you. So when I hear when I hear musicians say, "Oh man, you know, oh man, you you know, you only you you only play in the studio making records," 
Then I look at them, you know, I look at them and I tell them this. I say, yes, that is what I do. And I have 50 gold albums to show. And I have, in the morning, I can walk to the post, to, to, to my mailbox and pick up a royalty check. So when this virus came down, the ones that can't get out there and do shows, I still walk to my, 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 to my uh, mailbox and pick up a check. So they might talk about he's just a studio drummer, but I'm always working. Mm -hmm. But they don't know who I am. But I, I but I'm the. But to me, I always prefer to be a studio drummer over any kind of drummer out there because I can hear myself every day. My records play every day, all day around the world, mm -hmm. in malls, on the radio. Somebody is playing a record that I played on. And that's one of the facts that even to the day I die, they'll still be playing some of the records that I recorded. So all these drummers that talk about, well, all he do is sessions, when they stop playing, they stop playing. So I always prefer to be in the studio than to be out on the stage playing. That's, that's just the way I am. Yeah, well, I mean, that legacy is indisputable. I mean... Well, you know? I always get teased about that, you know. Oh, man, we don't know you, man. I say, you, you, you know this, don't you? <laughs> I say, you know this, don't you? Yeah. You know Hall of Fame, don't you? So I don't have no problem. I don't have problems anymore with them, you know, criticizing me for just working in the studio and not on stage doing solos and spinning sticks. That's over with now. Yeah. Um are there a couple of musicians, Earl, that you played with back in the uh, Philadelphia days uh, with those records that really stood out that people should really know? Maybe this guy was, you know, the best bass player of that era, the best guitar player of that era. Well, there's, well, there's only two people to me I think is the best in the world, and that's Norm, Norman Harris on guitar, Ronnie Baker on on bass. That's Baker, Harris, and Young, productions. The three. Yeah. Now, all of my studio musicians, are, to me, it was great. I'm from Roland, from, from Carl Chambers. He's a, he was a great drummer, too. You know, from Vince Montana, you know, to Larry Washington on Kumbas. All this, this was like a family, a family. I mean, we we a family. We knew each other so well. So to me, these were the greatest musicians, to me, that you know, I'd ever live, you know, because I, I guess because I work with him every day and I knew him so well and I could, you know, we knew each other so well that before they played something, I knew what they were going to play. And and the, and one of the facts, one of the great factors is that when we were in it, we were so close with Gamble and Huff and Tommy Bell and Bobby Martin that when Somebody didn't come to work. We call it going coming to work. Was sick, or wasn't feeling good, or had a bad day. Maybe the wife or something like that, and they wouldn't didn't have the spirit in them to record. We would shut down the whole studio. I don't care if it was what it cost. Nobody would replace anybody in in our crew. They would never say, "Okay, well, Earl ain't feeling good. So let's call another drummer in here." We didn't do that. If one guy wasn't feeling good. The session is over with to the next day. And that's the way it's always, that's where it's always been with the fill up, the, the fill up your sound. Everybody was, everybody was, we were just that close. We would cut a record, we would cut and we would listen to it. Everybody would go into the control room and listen to it. Everybody. Then we say, look, maybe we can do this better. What y'all think? Because they would ask us too, because they want our opinion. If you think you so he said, look, here what we do. Let's go on down to the bar for a while, go on to the bar and hang out. So there's a bar down the, on the corner. The whole unit is going down to the bar and play shuffleboard. It had a little shuffleboard in there. And we cut a couple of drinks and laugh and joke. Get your mind off of the music and uh, laugh and joke for about an hour. Then we come back in and uh, I don't know whether we was high or not, but, but we came back in and cut the, and cut the song. And so we could, can compare whether the first one was good and the second one was good. That's how we did. Just 
what we did might have been great, might have been bad, but they always wanted to see if we could do it better. I don't care how good a track came out. You know, that's one thing about uh, the Philadelphia thing. Let's say, well, I wonder if we could do it better. So let's do it again. And, or, okay, these are great. Let's come back tomorrow. And, do, and, and we used to get pissed, but they paid us. So let's come back tomorrow. Let's cut this again. They, they were already satisfied with it, but they wanted to see if it could be better. And that's, that's one of the things because that's what makes a gold or a platinum album is when you can get your best out of each musician. Mm-hmm. 